Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 125. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Have you turned your key and heard that dreaded tick, 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 tick because of a dead battery? No worries. I've got the NOCO Genius Boost Jump Starter. This compact tool fits in your glove box and features rechargeable lithium battery technology that will start a dead battery in your car, boat, truck, or RV. It packs a whopping 12-volt, 400-amp starting power and can start up to 20 dead batteries on a single charge. Plus, it has built-in spark-proof technology with reverse polarity protection to safely jumpstart your vehicle. The compact, ergonomically designed clamps are solid copper for maximum conductivity, and there's a built-in ultra-bright dual LED flashlight with seven modes, including an SOS emergency strobe. It's easily rechargeable with a USB outlet, and you can charge your smartphone or tablet while you're on the road. Works on any 12-volt lead-acid battery. The Genius Boost from NOCO is the ultimate emergency tool that's safe and easy to use. Quality design, state-of-the-art technology from NOCO, your battery care source since 1914. Get yours at GeniusChargers.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. Today, I'm really excited to introduce a very special guest, Richard Petruska. Richard, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I'm ready. Let's go. All right. Pedal to the metal. Richard Petruska's motor art exhibits the dynamic fluid motion of the automobile while simplifying the basic design lines of some of the most exotic vehicles of the past and present. Richard studied automotive design at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, where he received a degree in automotive design, and he earned his Master's of Fine Art there as well. He's been a professor at the college for over 40 years. He's a member of the Automotive Fine Arts Society, and he's won the prestigious Peter Helk Award for three years in a row, and he's won numerous Athena Awards for excellence at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, where I first was exposed to his creations. His amazing work can be seen in many automotive magazines, in private collections, and museums around the world, and of course, at his website. So Richard, I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Would you take a little bit of time and share some more about your history, your career, your interest, and of course, your passion for automobiles. Since a little kid, I started to, uh, after I gave up on uh, getting a horse, I decided (laughs) I would start drawing cars instead. And I didn't realize it at the time, but there was probably something going on in my my, uh, background there as a child. Uh Uh, And then I got introduced to automotive design by a brother-in-law. And uh, from there, I studied at Art Center, and then from there, I started teaching. I never really wanted to go to Detroit after moving to California because of a particular lifestyle. So I don't know if I... Sometimes I regret not becoming a designer like most other friends and uh, students I went to school with. But I managed to enjoy teaching. I taught a lot of famous car designers and so that part feels really good and after 40 years it still feels like i'm just starting starting out as a as a a, a designer of sorts so it's quite a quite a uh, honor to be there and to do all that work it's such a prestigious school and i've had many guests here on cars yeah that are graduates of art center or in the case of a few that actually are working there as well now as professors and so it's a spectacular place. I mentioned in our pre-show chat, it's a place I wanted to go to school when I got out of high school. I wasn't able to, but uh, I've always looked up to that college as uh, an amazing place that is producing some fantastic people. You got involved in art and fine art. What instigated your move from after, after studying automotive design to start creating the things that you create? I always had a passion for art and design, even as a child. I thought it would be a nice transition going from the the technical part of actually designing a car into doing the form studies and things that relate to automotive design. That seemed to have been the, the passion, passionate part that I found afterwards. I enjoyed so many of the old car designs, the some of the early French cars. They're just exquisite and so beautiful. And the forms that, that they established back then are timeless. So that part of the uh, uh, design world has always been a, 
uh, a constant reminder of how great things were in the past and how great they can be in the future. Well, what I really love about the variety of things that you create, and we'll encourage our listeners to go to your website, and we'll give them that site a little bit later in the talk, but you do some really, really unique things in the way you combine elements in your sculptures in particular, and in your paintings as well, but the sculptures are so unique, and tell me, how do you come up with some of these ideas? Because the combinations of the form of the car and then how you manipulate it and bend it and twist it with other parts of life, bodies of people, in some cases, where do these things come from? That's hard to say, but every year at Pebble Beach, we have to come up with new ideas. We're supposed to come up with, uh, the sculptors are supposed to come up with one new piece, the painters, three new pieces. But I always try to come up with something that sets my work apart from all the other sculptors and designers there. I spend many, many months looking for new ideas or trying to come up with something new. And there's usually a down period after Pebble Beach because I work so hard all summer long trying to get these pieces finished that after Pebble Beach, it's like, well, now I can relax and then I can get depressed. (laughs) (laughs) I go through all these phases and then finally something starts to spark an interest and then I go, okay, that's something I want to do next. And now the ideas are sort of just fermenting in my mind a little bit, and I'm looking around trying to say, how can I really do this next phase or this new sculpture? So that's the phase I'm in right now, and and some things are starting to come up where I'm going, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Maybe I should look into that a little more. Well, your mind is certainly percolating away because the variety of things that you come up with, it's not just the same thing reinvented. It's just It just keeps twisting and turning. So fantastic work. I, I yeah, love what you're doing. As we continue on your journey, I always like to start our talks with a success quote. And this is a quote that's been instrumental in forming your life and your success, something that has a great meaning to you. And it's a great way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars, yeah? So Richard, take the wheel. I always tell my students that to be successful, you have to practice perfect. Hmm. It doesn't mean just practicing, because that's that puts the old quote, you want to get to Carnegie Hall, how do you get there? You have to practice and practice and practice. Right. But that's not quite the same thing for when you're trying to be a creative individual. So practice perfect basically means if you want to do something really great, you have to find a great example to sort of work towards or use that as a goal. And it's, I found another quote from Picasso that said, great artists or good artists copy, great artists steal. And it's <laughs> sort of the same thing I feel, but you have to really look around for ideas. Uh, Chris Bangle, one of my old students, used to carry a sketchbook around with him all the time. And in that sketchbook, he would draw everything. And then he would eventually say, "Wow, oh, now I can see where I can use that particular little sketch. So that's sort of what I try to get the students to do. And I find that, it, for me, it's just the same way. I have to look for something unique and different. Yeah. Oh, that's really, really interesting. And so you taught Chris Bangle. Wow, that is pretty neat. <laughs> One of the many, actually. One of the many, yes. There's been some wonderful people that have passed through your classrooms, I'm sure, over all these years. How have you incorporated that success quote into your life of creating art? Yeah, that's a tough one because I'm constantly striving to do something that's better than the last piece I've done. And perfection, I know, is unattainable in a lot of ways, but it's something that you that you know, I want to strive for to have to be the best in what I do and to have people really understand what I'm doing. Yeah, and it's not that easy sometimes. It reminds me of that quote by Henry Royce. Strive for perfection in everything you do. Take the best that exists and make it better. When it does not exist, design it. So that practice comes into play, I would guess, just uh, as you start to create something in your mind, you just practice, practice on that one thing. Is that how you approach it? Well, and it, but that sort of leads to other ideas, too. So the more you keep practicing, the more diverse your, some of your ideas become, and then you see, ah, there's another possibility there. It's like brainstorming in a lot of ways. You, you start on one concept, and then you develop into something else, and before you know it, you're totally doing something different, and it's more exciting than the original concept. Sure. Well, I understand. I, I studied graphic design and advertising in college, and I remember those critiques of the, the pressure of getting up in front of the class and the professor and 
all the things you'd worked on so hard and then uh, not so much ripping it apart, but just realizing during that critique, oh, gosh, yeah, I should have gone there. I should have thought there. But that's part of the process, especially in school. But it gets even more brutal when the client's standing in front of you ripping, right. ripping it apart. So would you share a story with me that instigated your passion for cars, that pivotal moment that you can recall in your life that you really realized you were a car guy? Like I said earlier, I used to draw horses when I was a little kid growing up in Connecticut. And then somewhere in grade school, I actually realized that I'll never get a horse because of the family situation. And then uh, so I started drawing cars. I don't know why, but the car seemed to be the next logical mode of transportation, I guess. And then one day my oldest sister comes home from uh, Detroit with a a boyfriend or, or husband at the time that was a car designer for GM. Oh, wow. And his name was Hank Haga, and he was a pretty famous car designer. They visited one time, and he shows up driving a new Corvette, and it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then he started talking about the design profession and, and all that, and then he mentioned about the Fisher Body Craftsman Guild contest that GM used to have way back in the 60s and 50s and 60s. And he... Uh, told me about the competition and I got found out more from the from the guild. I got they you had to build a model car basically and then you submitted it with all the other model cars from young people all around the country. And it was basically a big competition and there was two divisions, the junior division and the senior division. The junior division was from 12 to 16 and the other one was from 16 to 18 or 19. If you win the region, they fly you out to Detroit, they wine and dine you. Of course, as a little kid, that wasn't the same. Sure. But we learned everything. We go to the tech center, and then they had a big banquet, and they announced the awards, and I won the top junior award. Wow. Which was a scholarship for about 5000 bucks back then. Yeah, it was a big deal. That sort of set me on the track. And then I learned more about Art Center, and then I decided that's where I want to go to school. Wow. My father entered that competition when he was in high school, and one of my prized possessions is the model that he carved out of a big block of balsa wood. Oh, cool. uh, the, yeah, I still have it sitting in my display case behind me here today. And, and he grew up on a farm in Texas in a very small town, so he was not exposed to many cars at all, if any, and mm -hmm. uh, other than farm vehicles. And when I was a little kid, I remember I found that in a box, and he gave it to me, and it oh, wow. still sits on my shelf. I've even got the ribbon that he won from that. So uh, I know that, that competition well. So very cool. He be, ended up being an architect, but uh, he's always been an artist his whole life as well. So well, We still need something like that nowadays because it's such, it was such a great venue for little kids to express their creativity. And, yes. And because we're constantly looking for this talent at Art Center now, and it's really hard to, to come up with uh, really, really great individuals for this for the school sure sure oh that's fantastic well congratulations on that Thanks. that win and that beginning to your your car lifestyle that's great i'd love right now richard to take a look at some of the roads you've driven down and crawl under the hood a bit and ask you to share a huge challenge or even a great failure that you faced in your career but more importantly share with me how you overcame that situation and what you learned from it well after graduating art center I had to make a decision whether I wanted to go to Detroit or to stay out in California. So it was a pretty tough decision. I eventually decided I was going to stick it, stick it out here and go back to school and get my master's degree in fine arts. And eventually, I think it was the wisest choice because I feel after, after ending up being an instructor at Art Center for all these years, I think I had more influence on the design profession than I probably could have as a designer. So that was one of the things, you know, I still have some regrets wondering whether I could have really made it back there or not. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's a, it's one of those soul searching things. You keep thinking, well, if I would have done this, it would have been different in my life. So right. I don't know, but I feel right now it was a good choice, but it was pretty tough at the time. Yeah, I can imagine. That's always those pivotal moments when you're a young person and what direction do I go down? What road do I go down? Which fork in the road do I take? I think you've chosen the right path, though. Look at what you've done for not only your students, but the work that you've created. So right, thank you. It's great. You're welcome. Richard, let's shift gears here and go to the other end of the spectrum. And I'd love for you to share a story when you had a real aha moment in your career, a, a time when you realized that, you know what, I think this is really going to make it. This is the right path, the right road to go down. And tell me the steps you took to turn that aha moment into a success. 
And like you said, you you went to Pebble Beach all those years, and I pretty much did the same thing. And going to the AFAS tent and seeing all that group, the group of automotive artists, and and I'm going, wow, these guys are great. And many of them were artists that I really was inspired by when I was at school. And so I decided, well, that's probably the place I should be. So I eventually got accepted to the group. It took a while to get in, but it's like now I'm very happy being in that group because now I have a venue in which to show all my sculptures. I've had many artists on this show, and uh, Nicola Wood, who's a member of the group, told me a similar story where she was, the, I believe, the first woman to be accepted. But when she first tried to get in, they said, nah, no thanks. The cars are too modern. And then uh, she ended up getting back in. But uh, I've heard similar stories from, from many, and I've met many great people who've become friends through AFAS and, and walking through that tent. So uh, for those of you who've been to Pebble Beach or are going to go to Pebble Beach, you've got to go in and, and see all the artists. They're just spectacular. How about your proudest moment in your career? Can you think, I'm sure you had many, but can you think of one that really stands out that you would share with me? The first one was actually getting accepted to the AFAS. The latest one is having taught at Art Center for over 40 years. So those are two of my, uh, the, I think, the proudest moments that I have right now. Getting accepted to AFAS, was that a, you said it took a while. Was the process uh, challenging, difficult, gut-wrenching, uh, anything in particular you can remember there? Well, the hardest part was at the time I was doing some sculptures, but it was, wasn't terribly ex- exotic or terribly exciting and different from what other people were doing. So I had to stretch it out and really look into my uh, uh, bag of tricks, if you want, to come up with something that really made my work stand out from all the other uh, sculptors that had the show. So after applying a couple times, I finally got accepted. And once you're in that show, you really got to strive to be uh, the best, because that's what we are. We're the best in the world as far as the automotive artists go. Well, stretching it is a great word you use there because a lot of what you create, there is physical stretching involved. Some of the ways that you've taken the car forms and wrapped them around things and pulled them and manipulated them, it's just, it's just incredible. I love it. Let's have a little bit of fun here. What was your first really special car? It doesn't have to be your first car, but one that really had a great meaning to you and maybe you could share a memory you had with that vehicle. Uh, my first car was actually my one of my favorite cars. It was a Triumph TR4, Ooh. 1963. Yes. And my uh, other sister had given me that car because I was going to Art Center, and I think she felt sorry for me then. No, <laughs> knew that I needed a car out here because you just can't get around L.A. with a, without having a car. Right. So I remember picking it up in Michigan. I had to drive it back to Connecticut to get it registered. And then this was in the middle of the winter. So oh, goodness. So there's a snowstorm happening, and it's chasing me all the way out to the West Coast. So I'm driving this car. The thing that I really liked about it, though, was the sound of the transmission. Every time you shift, it made this nice little click. Mm-hmm. It's so cool. I can remember that to this day. <laughs> But the funniest thing was the snow was chasing me, and I'm driving across country, and it's bloody cold, and I have a blanket wrapped around me. I have all the heater buttons on that I thought I needed to pull out, and it wasn't warming up the car. Yeah. So I was frozen by the time I get to Dallas, and I get to Dallas, I go to a Triumph dealer, and I say, what's wrong with my heater? He says, did you pop the vent <laughs> in the front of the windshield? <laughs> I go, no. He says, well, you need to do that in order to get the heat to flow through the car. Oh, goodness. So that was a pretty silly thing. And then the other crazy thing about the car was that when I struggled to put the soft top on, and I mean, you got to stretch this thing and do all this work, and my, my arms got tired and sore from doing this. And then someone says, no, you got to release the latch that lowers the frame down, and then you button it on, and then you pop it back up. So <laughs> those are the things that made me realize I didn't know a lot about cars at the time. Yeah, TR4 is a special place in my heart because a neighbor across the street when I was a kid had one, and I really wanted that car, and he he offered it for sale, and my dad went and looked at it with me, and, of course, I was a starry-eyed kid, and it looked perfect to me, and my dad just looked it over and went, uh, well, I've got a question for you. Do you want a car that you'll be working on all the time, or do you want a car that you can actually drive? All right. I ended up getting a Carmagia, which was a good choice because my one of my best friends bought that TR4, and about a month later, the engine blew up, and <laughs> it ended up being hauled off to a junkyard, I think. But I've always loved the design of that car. It's just a beautiful little car, and 
Uh, I used to travel in that thing. I drove all the way up the coast to to Canada in that one time, and wow. I used to sleep in it. I used to take out the or release the passenger seat so I can lie back and sleep in it. And I remember one time being on the beach in in Oregon, where you can actually drive on the beach, mm-hmm. and I drive the car into the in, on the sand, and then I get back to take a picture of it, and all of a sudden the water starts coming up. Uh oh. So I'm looking, taking a picture of my car, and the water's halfway up the center of the hub, and I'm going, there goes my car. Yeah. I run back into the car and get started, and luckily the sand was really dense, so I wasn't, I didn't sink at all, so I was able to get off the beach, but that was one of those moments where I go, oh. Yeah, <laughs> that could have been a bad one. I lucked out. Yeah. yeah, you know what comes to mind is one of my favorite movies, you're going to laugh, is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And uh, there's a scene in there where they're on the beach having a picnic and the tide comes in and, of course, the the car inflates and it floats away like Mm -hmm. a boat. But I don't think your TR4 had those uh, inflatable devices. Not quite the same. Not quite the same as as old Chitty Chitty. How about seller's remorse? Is there a car you've had in your past that you let go that you really wish you could have back in your garage? I had a couple of unique cars. A Mangusta was one of my favorites. Oh, you had a Mangusta? Yeah, that was, even when I was at school, that was one of my favorites favorite designs that came out that in the xke but the mangusta always had a special place in my heart here because of the fact that it was an italian design yes and it had that ford motor in it plus mm-hmm. the gold wings and all that so i uh eventually found one i mean i i didn't realize how expensive they were and then i actually bid it on one at an auction actually it was it might have been a rick cole auction but there was one, and I convinced the auctioneers to let me bid on it, but the amount went way higher than what I was willing and capable of spending on a car. Mm-hmm. And then eventually I'd go, well, I keep looking, and I'd finally, I think I might have sold a sculpture or something, so I had a little bit of money. And I finally found one, paid a lot for it, and it was a weird color, a weird dark green, mm-hmm. but it was such a neat car. And had it for a number of years, but then it got to the point where I didn't have enough disposable income to keep it running the way everybody else did, all the <laughs> sure. other members of the club. So I finally decided maybe I should sell it. Mm. So I finally sold it, but it, it turned out to be a good investment because the money I got from the car, although I lost a lot, I was able to use it to buy a piece of property that's worth a lot more now than the car would ever be. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, well done. But, oh, the Mongustas, oh, I love those cars when they came out when I was a kid. And I just, ah, just the designer of that car created some amazing vehicles. And that one in particular, just something about it. It just had that muscular stance. and Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jaro well. was a designer. and mm-hmm. and. Uh, we just had one at the, our car classic at Art Center, a yellow one, which oh, was nice. so exquisitely beautiful. Yeah, there's a gentleman up here in the Northwest that has a silver one, and he had it at the uh, LeMay Concours event this past summer at Pacific Northwest Concours, and uh, got to talk to him for a while, and uh, he let me sit in the car. I've never had the pleasure of driving one, but I've driven Panteras. I understand they're somewhat similar in the way they drive, but... Uh, Almost, but not as crude. The, the Mangusta was a pretty crude car. Yeah, yeah, I know, pretty hand-built, so that's fantastic. How about current projects? Is there a project that you're working on now that really has you excited and fired up? Like I said before, I'm in that stage where I'm trying to come up with this idea for something new this year, so mm-hmm. I'm still, I mean, I'm starting to get some some energy there and putting it in that direction. I just have to start focusing it now. Sure. Uh, and hopefully by the next month or so, I'll have something uh, more directly pinpointed so I can start you know, doing something towards Pebble Beach next right, year. Right, right. And you'll be at Pebble Beach next year, so we can all see what, what pops into your mind when when we are out there in August, right? It usually takes a while to come up with that idea, but then when they start coming out, all of a sudden there's lots of ideas. Yeah, so. oh, fantastic. Well, this next question came from a fellow AFAS artist, Harold Cleworth. So you can blame oh. him for this one because I was asking a different question originally here at Cars Yeah, and he suggested I ask him this question, and his answer was pretty darn unique, as you can imagine, <laughs> with Harold. At any rate, Richard, if you were a car, not your favorite car, but if you were a car, what kind of car would you be and why? <laughs> Leave it to Harold to come up with something Yeah, like that. yeah, he's a pretty wild and crazy guy. Well, thinking about it, it's, there was another Triumph. It was a TR8, mm-hmm. and nobody liked that car when they came out. It, it didn't get very good reviews because they thought it was too wedgy, and 
But something about that car always uh, had an attraction for me. And I was like, because it was so weird and because it was not understood at the time, that's pretty much how I feel most of the time. You're weird and not understood. <laughs> yeah. So it's like I have to deal with that all the time. Well, how did you come up with that idea? Well, what's wrong with you? <laughs> that type of thing. So I think a car like that is, is for me, it's, it was, I actually had one a few years ago. And oh, it's, okay. Uh, it, it's, um, it was a great car. You liked it? Yes. Yeah. Well, it was kind of cutting edge at the time from a design standpoint. And maybe, you know, lots of times cutting edge design, people have a difficulty with it and it has to grow on them. So, um, But if you notice the, that major design line down the side, mm-hmm. it's been used in almost every new car in the last couple of years. You know, you're right. Now that I and, think of it, yep. Yeah. And it's like it was there. Yeah. So. Well, that's very cool. That's a great answer. Good. Well, thank you, Harold. For that uh, question. Every time I ask it, I get a very unique answer. So it's a fun one. I'm glad he introduced me to that. All right, Richard, we're up to what I call the last lap. And this is where I fire off a series of questions. And you'll give our listeners some very quick blips of the throttle answers. So you ready to go? Okay. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? To follow your passion. (laughs) Yes. Go whatever you like and really make sure you're passionate about it. Would you share one of your personal habits that you believe has contributed to your successes? Besides being around a lot of young talent and and helping and contributing to their their goals as as far as becoming a designer, you learn a lot from these students, and and they keep you on your toes. So uh, like I was saying, it's always hard to come up with these new ideas, but the more exposure you have to different concepts, different things, it sort of keeps you very active mentally so that you're open to new new directions and new possibilities. Well, it's a great concept because uh, I've always thought that you are the culmination of the people that you surround yourself with. And so you are very fortunate because you're around so many creative people and young minds that are very fertile and, and coming up with all sorts of new and creative things. So that's awesome. You're very fortunate. Do you have a resource that you'd like to share with our listeners that you're really fond of? Maybe it's a website you go to often, or maybe it's a blog that you get. Well, actually, all it is is Google. Google. I, mean, I, <laughs> I tell my students, I mean, nowadays, they have it so easy. But yeah. in the old days, we used to have to go to libraries. We'd have to do a lot more research. We'd have to have books. I mean, I got tons of car books, but I hardly use them anymore. Because as soon as I want something, I just have to go to Google. And for the students, I tell them, well, just don't Google a nice car. You have to Google concept cars. If you're trying to come up with something unique, don't go to where the cars are existing now. Go to the future. Yes, yes. Oh, it is an amazing thing that we have at our fingertips. In fact, the blog I do each week on Cars Yeah, when you go to the website and you can subscribe, the one today has a lot to do with that very same comment. And it came from a guest that I had on the show, Patrick Hong. He talked about constantly pushing your thinking and and push your learning. And it was a quote by uh, Henry Ford about staying young in your mind through learning. So listeners will have to go check that out. How about hobbies outside of your passion for cars? Are there things you like to do outside of that? Uh, usually I play tennis Saturday morning to sort of get me, keep me active a little bit. And that's pretty much it, besides eating and enjoying a nice bottle of wine every now and then. And there you go. I'll remind our listeners you can find these resources that Richard has shared with us at carsyacom slash Richard Petruska. And his last name is P-I-E-T-R-U-S-K-A. All right, Richard, we're up to the checkered flag. And this last question can be a real doozy for car guys like you and me. If you could only have one collector car in your garage, and this is something you can't sell to buy a whole bunch of other cars with, so that little trick's off the table. But money's no object. Today I'm going to buy you whatever you'd like. What would that vehicle be, and why did you choose it? I hate to disappoint you and and the listeners, but I actually enjoy my NSX, my Acura NSX. Ah, okay. To me, it's just, uh, it's a stress free car. Uh-huh. It handles wonderfully. It's beautiful. It's almost one of those iconic uh, sports cars. And I mean, I just can't think of a better car that I would like to drive. I drive it. When I drive it, I feel like you're in a space capsule and it's so comfortable. It handles so well. To me, that's it. I don't think I want anything else right now. Wow. You're making it easy. I don't have to buy you anything. <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because some of my guests pick cars that are going to break the bank. So Uh, Those are really special cars. I've had many friends that have had those cars, and they've always called them the reliable Ferrari. 
Yep, that's it. Or the poor man's Ferrari. So well, <laughs> I'm a little more real, realistic now in my older age. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, they are uh, fantastic. I've had the pleasure of driving several of those, and including one on a racetrack. And uh, uh, wow, amazing. yeah, just really great cars. So great choice, great design from a great designer. Richard, you've taken us on a great ride today, and I really want to thank you. I've enjoyed your stories, and I want to thank you for sharing your journey with the Cars Yow listeners and with me. Could you give us one parting piece of guidance before you drive off into the sunset in that NSX? <laughs> Follow your passion. That's all I can say. That's Follow. the best quote, and that's it. If you love cars, go for it. That's it. And what's the best way for our listeners to learn more about you and your artwork? My website is rpmart.com. I was searching for my website name, and I had all these great ideas, and someone goes, well, why don't you just do rpmart.com? And it was like <laughs> Richard Petruska Motor Art. So yeah, I love it. It it's, was perfect. It's perfect. Well, I encourage our listeners to go to Richard's website because the things you'll see there, if you've not visited the site, you'll just be amazed. And it just keeps getting better and better as you flow through the pieces. So I'll make sure that that's posted up on your show notes page at carsyad.com. And th- Richard, thank you for being so generous with your time today and your expertise and, and for sharing your experiences with me and the listeners. It's been really fun to get to know you. Until we talk again, I'll see you down the road. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.